The one, the one thing I didn't want to point out from the science side of things in the science missions is that social aspect crosses engineering and science. And one of the things that I've always found interesting uh, about our uh, science missions is there's this interaction between the science team and what the science team wants and the engineering team that's trying to implement those science requirements. And oftentimes, over the course of a mission, you know, we'll start out with a certain set of science requirements, and the engineers will believe, frankly, that they can achieve those science requirements. And over time, they'll realize that, well, you know, this last 10% of the science requirement is costing 90% of the effort and is going to uh, result in a, a schedule slip or a cost increase. And so the engineers and the scientists will get together and they'll actually hash that out. And they'll say, well, instead of developing this system that we were trying to develop that now looks like it's going to be an overrun, maybe, maybe operationally we can deal with the situation a little differently. Or maybe we can back off a little bit on that requirement. Uh, and I've seen a number of examples in the Mars program and in, in other programs within the Science Mission Directorate where this trade between science and engineering has been done very effectively. And it all centers on communications and trust uh, and thorough analysis, frankly. Uh, you know, the engineers don't walk into the room with just ideas. They walk into the room with well thought out, uh, rigorous analyses to support their position. Mm -hmm. And the scientists, frankly, uh, do a very good job of being open of listening, of actually understanding. There are many scientists that I've worked with that are great engineers and, and can just get into the engineering details of their, their measurement system like, like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and they fully understand what the engineers are saying before a decision is reached. And it's that, that interaction, I think, uh, is very special. Uh, and it's something that NASA does extremely well. I, I would add to that that, so a key takeaway to, from that is allowing the requirements to be held at the right level yeah, exactly. so that where when you want to challenge a requirement because it uh, has a ridiculous cost associated with it that the engineers um, in the system or the safety or the flight crew or the, the, the technical organizations within the system can actually challenge those requirements push back on them and then that's heard at the appropriate level and disposition quickly so by Holding that at too high a level, that means that any change to those requirements takes a, a series of boards and panels all the way up the chain to get to the eventual resolution. The further down in the organization that you push that, the faster you can move yeah. and you can get to the innovative good ideas about how folks can make it cheaper, can develop it faster, can get you the same technical content potentially or not. But you've got to get that down into the engineer's hands. And you've got to get the engineers thinking that, or the technical communities thinking that, they are empowered to change these requirements. Right. That they ought to be, as NASA, pushing back on the requirements. They can't be held as sacred requirements. There is no such thing, right? We've, you've got to be able to challenge all assumptions and challenge all requirements. Yeah, that's a great way of saying it. 